Merkel Media. In the bustling heart of Miami, where the sun meets the sea, a new mystery unfolds. Rumors of towering creatures and strange happenings at the Bayside Marketplace Mall have caught the attention of Tony, the renowned monster hunter. Eager to find answers, Tony gathers his team for an adventurous quest to hunt down these beasts. Joining him on this journey is Joel Thomas, with his keen survival skills and knowledge of weaponry. Juan, the charismatic host of the One on One podcast, is known for his knowledge of the alchemical homunculus. Justin, the astute biologist from Cryptids of the Corn, whose insights into these creatures are unparalleled. And lastly, author and podcaster Isaac Weishaupt, who is one of the world's leading experts in occult symbolism. Together, they embark on a journey filled with suspense and unforeseen dangers, determined to uncover the truth behind this mystery. All right, guys, gather up. We've got a real situation in Miami. The Miami Mall Monsters is what they're being called. They came through portals and left everyone running for their lives. Joel, you're our weaponry expert. What do you suggest bringing? Yeah, I've got the Nephilim Blaster 2000 cocked and ready to go. And I've been waiting to bring this new toy out, and I think that this is the perfect occasion. Absolutely. Make sure you bring the netting rigs, too. I want to make sure that these things come in alive if possible. Tony... I've got my sample kits prepared. If we manage to take one alive, I'll be able to collect, well, uh, whatever monster stuff we get from one. Good thinking, Justin. Make sure you're prepared to collect samples of dead specimens because that's probably where this is going. Juan, you're going to be our lead tracker on this one. Yeah, something tells me these things aren't natural. I'll be able to identify them and find them for us. <coughs> They're homunculus. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. Isaac, do you have everything you need? I heard there was talk about these symbols where the portals open up, where these creatures came through. I'm going to bring my journals on symbolism. Maybe they'll tell us where these creatures actually came from. Yeah, that could be our key. Keep the journals close. All right, that's it. We're ready to... Hey, what's all this about? Are we having a garage sale or something? No. Jack, you're always out of the loop. Have you not heard about the Miami Mall monsters? Wait, the Miami Mall what? All right, everyone sit down. Let's go over this one more time, especially for Jack. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand, and he's running really fast. And spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge, and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Juan, you got uh, theories and thoughts and I'm assuming everybody has some kind of thoughts on things. Uh, but let's kind of recap a little bit though as far as what actually is going on in Miami and th that we know of. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of those things where it's like, I I've, I've been seeing so many different perspectives and then, you know, people coming out saying they were there only to say they were trolling. And then more people coming out that seem to have credibility talking about their experience that they're not recanting. And I'm just like, what is going on in the Miami mall? So, um, Justin, if you want, uh, go ahead and let us know what 
how did how did you first start finding out about this Miami Mall stuff, and what what do you think of it so far? So listeners started messaging us about sea monsters that had walked into a mall, and and it's you know it's hearsay stuff, and that's because you know we're sea we're more sea monster people, and I was a fish guy, so they're all super excited that a sea monster had walked up into a mall, and I didn't think anything of it until I think it was Joel or somebody texted me, and that's how it. it I started finding it. And first, when you searched on it, nothing came up. It was all four teenagers with fireworks and sticks. And then it was 50 teenagers with fireworks and sticks. And then it all started like coming out more and more days. That's how it got kind of pushed to me is some listeners talked about sea monsters, which I couldn't find. I looked and looked and looked the last couple of days since we've been talking about doing this, of finding that initial report of creatures coming out of the water. Because it's right on the water, right? It's literally the bay is like right there, and then the beach is, you know, a couple hundred yards away. And I couldn't find anybody that had stepped forward and, you know, and said that that's what they had seen as something come out of the ocean. But I just thought that was an interesting part for that. Yeah, I think that you know, they definitely came out of portals. I mean, that's that that's just a one hundred percent given. Like we're not we're not even going to entertain <laughs> the sea monster thing, okay? So, <laughs> um, but. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Isaac. I want this to be well, a free flowing conversation. Like, don't yeah, worry about. Yeah, just, I'm not trying. I don't want to cut you off, man. Your stream of consciousness. So, uh, to to talk about, I actually hadn't heard about the sea monsters <laughs> side of the house, but it is to me. It was always interesting because there is a theory about how Antarctica, for a variety of reasons, is the place where they they found, uh, you know, ancient aliens pushed ideas that there was buried. UFOs 100,000 years ago. Uh, Bob Lazar talked about this in in his um, testimony about his experience working with UFOs and reverse engineering technology. Plus, uh, Hitler and the Nazis supposedly went down there looking for alien UFO stuff. Um, and uh, also in John Carpenter's movie, The Thing, that's, of course, where they come across the, the alien uh, craft that they thaw out and, you know, everything happens. Now, it's interesting because Miami, of course, is the closest city to Antarctica. I don't know if that necessarily proves anything, but uh, it is interesting that they would find these aliens so close to where there's this long history of conspiracy theory. Did and you to did piggyback, you back and to piggyback on what Isaac said real quick uh, earlier today? There was a girl that came out and pulled the coordinates from the mall. And if you reverse the coordinates, they end up in Antarctica. So that was really odd. And it makes you think. Can I that check that? Either, yeah, and and Justin actually checked the coordinates, and they do through, yeah. end up on Antarctica. So that was really odd. Now, is this some sort of, I don't know, portaling system between Antarctica and the mall, or it was theorized that they reversed the coordinates and ended up in the wrong place, and maybe that's why they were confused when they were walking around. If we're going with the entity idea. I got the scoop on that. All right. So here, here's the lowdown. And I'm, I'm not here to, to toot my own horn, but if you look up occult origins of Florida, you Google that, I come up. All right. So here, here's the lowdown, guys. Everybody talks about the Babylon working ritual with Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard, who were in Miami at one point when Hubbard had stolen Parsons' girlfriend and his boat. And allegedly, when part, when part, and when Hubbard took off, Parsons conjured up the spirit of Mars or some crazy demonic entity and brought them back in. That was off the East Coast, and they they ended up catching him. He ended up coming back. And nobody talks about, so the Babylon working was 1940s, and we have in the 1980s the evans Keenan cell workings, okay? And uh, this Jeffrey D. Evans guy was the head of the Typhonian OTO in the United States, Okay, and there is this whole book who was co-written or I guess organized by Lavenda in which they were doing a series of sex magic rituals in Miami, Florida, because Miami, Florida was a power zone, what they call the power zone. Now, if you know anything about the Typhonian OTO, which I know Isaac does. What's a power zone? So a power zone is a place where you can essentially contact things on the other side. So a power zone, like a, a portal pretty much, so but like, it gets, a tra- like a charged area, a charged area. But here's the kicker okay. because you guys are talking about Antarctica, the power zones move around. 
because the power zones are parallel in space and in time. And it gets, again, it gets crazy. It gets crazy because you're talking about portals. Well, Tony, these people believe, because you talk about mind portals, well, the whole aspect of as above, so below, microcosm, macrocosm, if we all are all stars, how the Lima states, well, how there is in outer space, portals, black holes, things to enter into other dimensions, faraway galaxies, planets, et cetera, et cetera. Well, guess what? You can tap those in in us, right? This is, again, Thelemic views, right? I'm talking about the Thelemic views. And this is where yoga comes into play because they believe that by positioning their body in certain ways, they can access these other realities and use their actual body as a portal. So to bring forth these entities into... So, so what ends up happening was in 1980s, this guy and his wife, and they end up doing these crazy, bizarre rituals. And you can read about it. It's called The Rites of the Mummy, the Cur Law Cell, and the Secret Creed to Lieber Al by Jeffrey D. Evans and Peter Lavenda. Now, again, it gets very, very weird. So just, just a heads up. But essentially, what he, this guy ends up doing is in 1984, I believe, April 2nd, 1984, he ends up... <laughs> they were trying to induce an abduction. And it ended up happening. And this guy ends up becoming impregnated by these alien entities. The guy, because I left out that he was actually a cross dresser and he's cross dressing during this magical ritual. Again, it's a whole crazy thing. So he gets up impregnated, not by a baby, but by this crazy secret mathematical formula in order to decipher Liber Al, the book of the law by Aleister Crowley. And it's all ties into pi. So the, the, you know, the string of numbers, one point, whatever, whatever, whatever. And essentially how pi is this key in other realms to be able to decipher their reality. Again, it gets very, very crazy, but this all happened in Miami. Okay. This all happened in this power zone that the Typhonian, the head of the Typhonian OTO at the time, they were doing these sex magic rituals. And again, there's a reason why. SpaceX is here. We have NASA here. We have Disney World, the most magical place on earth. We have all these different things and we have the history of Florida is directly tied to John D. Rockefeller. Okay. And our federal reserve system. I'm sure you guys have heard of the Tim Bent and Rob Skiba federal reserve interview that he's done where at the Rockefeller, Rockefeller cottage in Jekyll Island, was an old sacrificial site for the Tamuqua, which the Tamuqua in Florida have been tied to the Nephilim. These giants that were here, and there's evidence, again, this is all Narcolongo territory where Florida was perhaps either the Garden of Eden or remnants of Atlantis. And that all ties into this Typhonian, Thelemic, magical, Atlantean magic, right? That right with, with Bimini and the remnants and all that stuff. And we have this at the, at the center of it all, the Bermuda Triangle, which is one of these gateways. Okay. So we have the HP Lovecraft elements of it, the Lovecraftian Cthulhu mythos elements, which by the way, Lovecraft lived near the Bridgewater Triangle, which you just finished covering not too long ago. What do they have there? They have the same sort of thing. Entities coming through, UFOs, and the, the Typhonian OTO, according to Kenneth Grant's work, it's all about tying in magic as the form of technology to interact with these alien slash demonic slash whatever entities that you want to insert here. Okay. So I think that's why Florida has been at the center of a lot of things. I mean, there's a reason why the Florida man archetype is a thing, because I believe, in my opinion, the energy here in Florida, if you can't handle it, it'll drive you insane. It'll have you chewing people's faces off. I mean, there's dudes chewing other dudes' faces off here in Florida. You know, that was the whole thing for a while. That really tripped me out when I was, I just graduated high school. I was, I was like, what in the world? Can you imagine some dude just gnawing your face off? That's the Florida man archetype. Anything that you hear about, you go, must have been Florida because it's crazy here. And it's a spiritual, it's, it's spiritual. And I don't think, in my opinion, because I was on Christmas Eve and I'll leave it towards the end 
on Christmas Eve, I was right down the road at the Robert, the Patricia and Robert Frost Museum, which I could see from the top where I was. I could look over and see the Bayside Marketplace. There's a nice area in, in downtown Miami, Brickell. I could see the, the, the Bayside Marketplace, okay, which is right on the water. So I was there Christmas Eve. Now, I'll leave it towards the end of, of what I think might have happened, but I think these things were not physical entities, but more of metaphysical, demonic entities. And my whole thing is, I don't know about you guys, but lately, and I talked about this a, a little bit a while back on my show, I've been seeing shadows in my peripheral vision. And I was just in Georgia and I had a crazy one where I thought there was somebody walking up on me. I turned around, there was nobody there. So this has been happening to me more and more. And I actually talked about that on my show and I had a whole bunch of people hitting me up. Like, hey, I've been having that too happen to me. It's like, what's going on? Are, is, is CERN on overdrive? Have they yeah. turned up you know, to, to 110? Like, what's, what's happening? And I think this could have been part of that whole situation. Yeah, I mean, these definitely don't... I, I don't think that what people were describing, I don't think it sounds very physical to me at all. Uh, I mean, I've even heard, I, I think it was last night I was on a space on Twitter and uh, the guy was talking about, you know, his experience. And I think he, he said that the bodies were almost triangular. If I remember correctly, uh, Joel, you I, were I in there, right? Did he say that? Yeah, he did. But he also said that they were phasing in and out of con uh, you know, consciousness. So he when he turned around, he saw them in front of him. And he said he wasn't scared of them because they were actively trying to harm anybody. But he said he was fearful of it. I didn't know what it was. And so he just kind of took off and ran like everybody else. Uh, there was now there was a whole other report of the one guy that saw the nerd kids that came in with like some sort of box and went and sat in the middle of the mall and turned some sort of box on that created some sort of energy field around it. And he even drew, he's a graffiti artist, uh, also a DJ, and he drew what came out. And it's very Shadow Man-like because the foot came out, the arm came out, and then it wasn't even really a head. It was more of like some sort of projection of some sort of head that came out with it. And he said that there were people that were concealed carry, started shooting at it. But the kids that came in, uh, they just went in there and set it up and just started doing this. So. Again, we don't know what's true. The guy could be trolling too, but everybody that's had an experience there, from what I'm starting to gather, that these experiences aren't of flesh and blood, really. Like it's more of entity forms, shadow forms uh, that's coming out of there. I haven't heard yet of a report of something that was just like a like a nephilim or a nephilim that was eight feet tall nine feet tall that looked humanoid that was walking around stomping around these things seem to be phasing in and out of reality and i am leaning more towards that as the more i've heard now again people could just be piggybacking off each other and saying well i heard this guy say this so i'm gonna follow along with what he said and put this similar story out who knows right but in that aspect, I think that that's where my mind's going on it. I do think that there's a high probability of a portal being open, very similar to what Juan was just talking about uh, w with anything Crowley was doing. Um, uh, you know, Kenneth Grant talked about all that, the Amalantra workings, any of that stuff is, is very similar to probably what was going on there. Um, if it was, a portal that opened up. And I want to add too that according to Lavenda, because uh, Justin brought up the sea creatures, sea monsters, well, part of that is the Lovecraftian aspect of it, right? The shadow over Innsmouth and all these crazy words like these half fish, half humanoid creatures right feeding on the townsfolk whatever it is they do sacrifices at the end of the year towards them right the 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 deep ones all these lovecraftian aspects well according to peter lavenda florida is the 
pull it up here. They, he refers to it as the not the fountain of youth, but the fountain of death. And according to Lavenda, Florida is actually the best place for the manifestation or summoning of these deep ones, of these great old ones, because, and I'm going to pull it up here. This is directly from that book. Uh, the old ones, in other words, had no use for the humanity. Other other indications that Florida is a geographical and topographically ideal for the evocation of such entities, such as Cthulhu and Dagon, are the fact that they are geologically, oh gosh, geologically, uh, where am I? Golly, geologically, the region is composed of primarily coral, which is the melded bones of dead colonies of the type of primal sea creatures that represent the old ones. Astrally, in the fact that its shores are aligned with mangrove swamps, mangroves being the plant of the old, indic indicating of the old ones, a tree, uh, a type of tree that is especially representative of the old ones, there is the Everglades, a vast sea of grass serving as a filter system to the inland waters of the North America, et cetera, et cetera. Then there are the bones of Florida. Great quantities of ancient bones, some of them belonging to animals now extinct. And there have been numerous findings of bog people, completely intact skeletons of people because of the low acidity in the water here. They find entire bodies fully preserved with brain matter and everything, thousands of years old. So they have that. He goes on here, the coral caverns and tunnels that underlie the northern two thirds of the state. The porous limestone has helped to create the phenomenon knows that known as sinkholes. One of my fears is, and I did a whole video on this, we interviewed a cave diver here in Florida and they, they go into these little holes and rest in peace because he actually died in a cave system like a couple months ago, the guy that we interviewed. And they'll squeeze into these little holes in, the, in, you know, in these aquifers and they come out and there's these massive cave systems. Well, the problem with that is the places that they were going to were underneath neighborhoods so think about it you're laying in bed here in florida and it could be five ten feet of limestone before you're at the top of a hundred foot drop because under there is a, a, a tunnel system with a and you're at the top of a hundred foot drop so whenever i'm sleeping here at night in florida that's what i'm thinking i go maybe underneath me is a whole cavern that people get sucked up by these sinkholes never to be seen again okay these sinkholes hope open up and the people are gone. They don't find them. Sometimes you, they, they've heard stories of them like screaming for help. There's nothing you can do. Once the ground opens up, you're gone. So we have here the, and then in South Florida, there was the spread of right ancient African cults and their Santeria, Paolo, different uh, versions of, of Vodun or Voodoo. Now, I'm not here to piss anybody off because I've gotten emails and stuff of of people who are witches and practitioners of these things. Again, no disrespect to you, but I'm just reiterating the literature. Okay. So just a, a, disc, a disclaimer there. And so we have this whole South Floridian magical community that was prevalent, especially in the earlier, you know, eighties and all that stuff there. So, and, and during the 1970s, I posted about that story of hysteria high, which was this school, this private school that allegedly they were doing Ouija board seances and this little girl got possessed and started screaming in a voice that wasn't hers, that she was the devil, that she was Satan. There was this other thing where this little boy jumped out of a window with like superhuman strength, jumping around, demonically possessed. Again, these are all first hand accounts and come to find out the uh, Memorial Hospital on there. One of them, I had to ask my wife, which one? It was because she's from, from Miami. And I was like, where's this uh, hospital at? She's like, well, that's the one over by where we went to over here. And according to the Tribune uh, in the 1970s, they were treating up to 700 demonic possessions a month. That's crazy. Per month. So again, what's happening in Florida? Because we're having this Antarctica connection with, again, the Mountains of Madness, H.P. Lovecraft talking about this sort of stuff. And that's for, for a second, right? We're on the confessionals. What if these portals align themselves, how we said in space and time, but not only that, but geographically in some sort of weird way, they warp themselves together and they open up these parallel portals, if you will, where it's open here in Florida, but it's also open in Antarctica or it's also open in Egypt or it's also open in Australia simultaneously. 
I mean, these are all things we can think about and and hypothesize about, right? There's because, a, go ahead. I was going to say that you, you you mentioned the mountains of madness, and that's the the you know H.P. Lovecraft story that the thing is based upon that we were talking about earlier. And um, there's a couple of interesting elements here. Uh, you know, Kurt Russell, who starred in the thing, he was the pilot who first called in the Phoenix Lights case in the late '90s. Uh, which is very odd, right? He said he said he called it in because he thought something was weird, but didn't think much of it. And then, um, then um, it wasn't until later he saw it on the news, people talking about the Phoenix Lights, that he said, "Oh, that was you know, I was the pilot that called in the first one." Which it, the, that weird lapse of memory again ties into so many abduction stories. But um, to tie into some of these occult elements, uh, I'd like to zoom out for some people, uh, you know. I know Juan, he goes, he goes hard in the paint on the occult stuff. So some people might not be familiar with why this is even coming up. The, you're talking about Peter Lavenda and this Typhonian OTO and, and, and Typhon, of course, is the, uh, you know, a creature depicted as from the abyss, right? The serpent, so yeah. it would make sense. The watery, uh, you know, abyss connection there. Um, but a lot of the ideas are that there's occult magicians and we'll, uh, you can try to like direct lineage from, you know, Jack Parsons to Aleister Crowley, even throw Joseph Smith from the LDS uh, creation story to John D and all the way back to the book of Enoch, which is where the idea of the Nephilim come from. It's the idea that in the book of Enoch, which is, a, I believe it's three different books. There's this story about how before the great flood, Noah's great grandfather, Enoch, um, he wrote this stuff down or, or, or the story was st- from him that the watchers were these fallen angels that were kicked out of heaven, came down to earth, procreated with the women and taught uh, and, and created these giant alien hybrid creatures called the Nephilim. And if you read the book of Enoch, they talk about how the watchers were teaching the forbidden arts to all these people on earth. They were teaching them ritual magic and all these things. Um, and then that's sort of the short version of it. Then you fast forward to John D, who's this famous astrologer in the in the Middle Ages. I think it was about the 1500s. He was Queen Elizabeth the first uh, advisor, and he was doing all these rituals to make contact with entities, uh, which he thought were you know angels and demons and things like that. And he successfully made contact with various angels, and they told him, "Hey, write down this sort of codex." And this is how you can talk to us. And it was this grid of characters and they called it the Enochian language. And it's supposed to be um, the, uh, the, the language that God spoke to Adam with going back to the Garden of Eden. So John D, he did all this stuff and made all these contacts, had this vision of the end times, which arguably could be one of the motivations for why so many people are trying to bring a manifest aliens or create a sort of catalyst to make a change in the world. I mean, that's a whole another rabbit hole. You could go down to this idea that what they really want to do is rebuild the Temple of Solomon at any cost possible because they think that they're going to force Jesus to return and that's going to sort of usher in the final age. But um, anyways, John D. writes down this Enochian language. Some time goes by, a couple hundred years. Joseph Smith uses this Enochian language to make contact with an angel called Moroni up in New York. And, um, and it's interesting because Damien Eccles, the guy who, you know, from the West Memphis three, he, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you guys know his story. He got sent to prison for killing these kids because he was into Aleister Crowley and, and black metal music and Metallica back in the eighties. Then HBO did all these paradise lost documentaries, uh, started putting holes in the, the police work. And Damien Eccles ends up, getting released from prison on an Alfred plea and he gets out of prison and he continues to be this prominent occultist and he's uh, studied the occult works going back to before he was imprisoned. And he actually is fascinated by the LDS Mormon faith. He was actually in Utah and, and, and studied it. And I, I think it's because it proves to people who get into this stuff that you can in fact channel knowledge and wisdom from, entities from another dimension, angels, demons, aliens, whatever you want to call it, um, or ultra-terrestrials as um, the, uh, John Keel 
described in the eighth tower back in like the seventies. Um, but anyways, so then Alistair Crowley comes along and um, I think Joel mentioned the Amalantra working. He uses that same Enochian language in 1917, 1918 to channel this first gray alien called lamb. Then Jack Parsons comes along 30 years later and he does the Babylon working again, using the same language, using the Enochian language. And then from there, the Pentagon, the U S government, they start just funneling all these resources into studying this phenomenon because they know there's a, a, a uh, you know, like a weaponized purpose they can use this for. If they can channel wisdom, technology, what have you, or do it before the enemy forces do it. And, and, and you know, it's funny because they, they gaslight everybody. And that's, and that's one of the main topics I want to, I want to talk about with this Miami thing is how interesting it is that the, the, the population we've, we have all these, all these mistrust in institutions, the police force, the mainstream media, nobody trusts any of these people anymore. Right. And, and that you could argue whether that's good or bad. I mean, the, you could argue it's bad because it could be setting us up for something worse, uh, a more militant fascist dictatorship. Like that's possible. That's, that's one area where I do think they might want to take us, but um, it is good to question authority uh, always. Absolutely. And the police force, um, you know, they're allowed to lie to us. They really are. Um, I don't want to pick on police individually, but as a force, as a whole, they do look at, at from my perspective and my humble opinion, they do look at us as it's us versus them. So if you're not part of the, 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 the police force, then you're sort of on another level and they do have laws where they're allowed to lie to us. And that's why people always say like, don't talk to the police. Right. Which I actually, you know, I get it. Right. I, and look, my, my father was in law enforcement. So like I stand on both sides of this issue. Right. Um, but the police are allowed to lie to us and that's why no one trusted. They see with their own eyes. They say, that's an awful lot of police for, for sticks and fireworks. Yeah. You know, and then there's of course a rash. Well, go ahead. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah. No, I didn't mean to jump in. Here's a thought. I thought about the whole police incident because I saw a lot of people online saying if this was an alien agenda or if there were entities involved that were considered um from outer space why was it just the police involved and there weren't any government agencies that were involved with this too outside of maybe a couple of black apache choppers that they saw in the air one of my thoughts was and it's just thinking outside of the box were they all really police were they just masquerading as police that were coming into this place because the guy yesterday that Tony and I heard talking said that on their way out, that the police had some sort of device that they were scanning everybody's phones with on their way out of, yeah. of the actual mall area. So were they scanning these, was this device scanning it to erase anything that was recorded? Cause everybody's like, well, if it's real, you got to have the recordings. Well, not if this was an actual operation and check this, if we're talking about the occult, and opening up portals and the amalantra workings in any of those from the hermetic order that are coming in and it's been infiltrated into the government because they use these, they use all of these things they have for a long time. What if this was actually the setup was they knew what was going to happen and they had this police in, in quotes to show up to if you've got police showing up and it's not government agencies, people aren't going to question it. If you say that it's a bunch of kids fighting or if you show videos of kids fighting everywhere, like, well, yeah, the police, you know, came out there. Why weren't the government involved? So were these actual police? We don't know. It's just, I'm just it's throwing this theory out there. Yeah. It's interesting that you're saying that because, um, it's, it's almost along the lines of, um, what if they, if this was orchestrated, were they orchestrating it going back to the coordinates? What, what if they brought these entities or whatever they were here and they escorted them? I mean, like nobody knows what happened to these entities. If, if it's, is all real. Right. So, um, I think they even asked, uh, the guy last night on the space, if, uh, he saw where the entities went, he said, no. And it doesn't seem like anybody has ever really seen where these things went. So what if these people, whoever they were, police or whatever, they actually come in to escort these, but they brought them in and then escorted them to wherever they want for their future the purposes. RIPD. Oh my gosh. It was that, that, that whole movie. Isn't that the movie? The RIPD? 
the Netflix. Yeah. So uh, Isaac is bringing up. So you guys are all what you talked about, Joel, triangular entities, Isaac, the Enochian. That's very important because I've even tied John D to Florida, right? The Harkness. Harkness was a silent partner of John D. Rockefeller. They were involved in, right, with Henry Flagler, all the Henrys, the establishing of Florida. So that's a whole other podcast. But the triangular, the accounts that you get from people who mess around with Enochian magic is, you know, this whole argument of angels. Was it angels or was it angles? Right. So whenever they encounter these entities on the other side, similar to how our, our boy Evans got impregnated by this mathematical parasite, I guess that you can, a numerical parasite, if you will. They, they, and it's interesting because Miami and Chaldean equals 11. 11 is the number of uh, enthelema of magic of, you know, Abrahadabra has 11 letters in it. So like this number 11 is the magical number for enthelema. And so we have the Enochian entities. And whenever somebody talks about that, again, it's very abstract. Like when they encounter these entities on the other side, they're very geometric in nature, okay? And there's a reasoning why the tablets are laid out the way they are. And essentially what was happening with John D was he was being shown essentially another dimension and how to interact with entities on another a parallel dimension. That's what scrying is, you know, looking on the other side. And so what I'm thinking is happening, what if they were running, right? Let's say it wasn't physical. And let's say that they were manifesting these geometric type esque entities into into reality using Atlantean technology off the coast of Florida, right? The Bermuda Triangle and all that good stuff. And they were running some sort of psyop or not a psyop, but a sort of operation to see what the effects would be on people. I mean, who knows what are, it's not the first time the government would have tested something on its people. It's like, Hey, let's see how far we can contain this with social media, with the technology that's around, with all the cameras. Like, let's run this op. Let's use this Enochian tech. And Evans literally talked about how his he had seizures. His seizures got worse. And he was actually driven insane from the download that he got of the abduction and impregnation of these alien technologies. And really quick, the whole Kerr Law system was a it was all about powering a transmitter slash receiver setup, which is operated by terrestrial agents of the old ones. And it was about the manifesting of uh, various things, the solar child or mother goddess. So again, bringing forth like the Babylon working, wanting to bring forth this femunculus because she was a woman. So a, a sort of homunculus S type of thing, right? And bringing forth, but it was going to emerge, right? The the dragon slash crocodile entity, right? This Sebek Ra type of uh, creature against Egyptian was going to emerge from the mud swamp, which is the Florida Everglades. Okay, so we have this connection of manifestation of this entity and the solar child. Well, NASA, SpaceX, Disney World, all these corporations that are aligned along the 28th parallel, well, the 28th degree of Templarism is the sun degree. What is Florida? The Sunshine State. What is there a lot of in Florida? There is crocodiles, alligators, reptilians. I mean, that, that's the whole thing. So I think somebody commented, was, I think it was David from Nephilim Death Squad. He was like, I hope the Nephilim start here because he's in Florida. I hope they start here. And I was like, well, it's funny you say that because there's a good chance they could start here because of <laughs> X, Y, Z. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, and that's the thing. I mean, when, one second. Uh, when, the, when we talk about these entities, when I say entities, I, I do that loosely because I don't know how to define it. Uh, when we're talking about these things phasing in and out and not seeming physical, um, I still think that these things could be very physical, just not presenting themselves in a physical manner. Uh-huh. Uh, and so when you were bringing up the idea of the Nephilim and stuff, that's something that I believe about the Nephilim for sure. I do believe that they transcend dimensions today. And I think that just because what you perceive is not phys- doesn't seem physical doesn't mean it can't it can't be physical uh and so with what people were seeing i mean it really could have been something where they were perceiving or seeing something that later became more physical i believe i i i'm pretty confident when i say that the longer these things are in this realm the more physical they become and so we we've seen that actually just out of florida the um 
the, the that real famous dog man video that I always refer to comes from the state of Florida where the guy uh, filmed it on Facebook Live. And so that was a very metaphysical thing that, that was caught on video. But then there's other people who have experiences with these things that are, uh, they're very, very, very physical. So my running thought is that the longer they're in this realm, the more physical they become. And so if these things just came into the realm in the mall, it would make sense that they would be not perceived as physical yet. Uh, what were you going to say, Isaac? So Juan opened a whole can of worms there. You start, start talking about angles. And it's interesting because I had read a book by William Ramsey about the order of nine angles maybe two or three years ago. It's the satanic group that believes in the idea of mass human sacrifice. They call it calling to uh, sort of get rid of the undesirables is the short version. But the order of nine angles, the reason it's called that is because of the symbol they use, which is a, a combination of a pentagram and a trapezoid. And this is inspired by a couple things, but the idea is that the pentagram uses sacred geometry, the golden ratio, uh, which um, I believe the golden ratio is phi, which is half of pi, right? Um, let me look that up before I... That's what Evans wrong. was impregnated with, too. It was all about pi, pi, phi, phi, yeah. pi. It was like all that. Yeah, because these are like mystical numbers, and, and the reason numbers are mystical goes all the way back to Pythagoras, who had the first secret society, 500 BC. So this is a this is an, as old as time itself. And the order of nine angles, um, you know, they, they utilize this and they base their rituals on uh, Anton LaVey's rituals of the Church of Satan. And he based a lot of his ideas upon H.P. Lovecraft, which and, and H.P. Lovecraft, of course, had this quote unquote fictional Necronomicon, this book with a grimoire book of, of spells to make contact with entities. Right. Um, and a sort of side note that fits in along with this the guy who um the guy who basically built the pentagon uh i think it was general leslie groves he was he designed the pentagon and the pentagon like we said it has the the sacred geometry with the golden ratio as it's uh, i believe like the vertices of its um the angles on it but he also was the director of the manhattan project which is what gave us the atomic bomb and with the atomic bomb, you can start talking about how that supposedly opened up a portal back back when they when they detonated it at the Trinity site uh, back in 1946. And you know, from there, you, you can go as wild as you want because Jack Parsons was doing the Babylon workings at this time. The first actual UFO crash that's pretty well documented is called the Trinity crash. At the same time, happened like a, uh, within the same week as the uh, Trinity test. On the thirty third, uh, because a lot. I'm sorry. On the thirty third parallel, that's right along where Zora Ranch of Jeffrey Epstein too. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's just it just opens up this this massive can of worms, you know. And uh, I don't know, you just get my brain going on all these things because all the, I feel like I do feel like all these things are connected. And that's why I'm always pushing my Twin Peaks stuff on you guys. You know, <laughs> Twin Peaks depicts I started, bro. every. <laughs> it depicts every single one of these elements, and you got to stick with it because I, as you guys know, I. It, I couldn't. I tried to watch this show for ten years. I always thought it was stupid. I get halfway through season one, I was like, "This is dumb. Why am I watching this? Give up!" And and I got so sick last winter. I finally just sat down and, and plowed through it. And I mean, it just blew my mind. It's an initiation, Isaac. That's why it's stupid. At first, the first season, it's like, "What is this garbage?" Because I'm halfway shaking, through season yeah. two. You're this shakes the tree. It just shakes everybody. Like I get out all the normies. And once you step into season two, the beginning is like. All right, the first season was dumb, but I am 100% convinced it's an, an initiation because the first people, if you don't stick around, you're not going to get the juice, the what I yes. call the gnosis nuggets. Because when it starts to pick up, you're like, this is going where I wanted it to go and and some. Like, it's going there and some. And it's dude, I think wait, all of this is absolutely tied. Yeah. Wait till you get to season three, dude. You're going to be blown away because that's how I felt about it. I, I kind of It kind of ebbed and flowed as did my interest of whether it was a good show or not. I, I I got through season three. I said, "Holy crap, there's a lot going on here." Yeah. And then I read Mark Frost's book. Mark Frost is the uh, him and David Lynch were the two minds behind this whole Twin Peaks universe. And you read the Mark Frost books about the secret history of Twin Peaks, and it just verifies everything. Right? This thing is it, it's just onions, and you and it's peeling back. And most people, I would argue, they peel back the first couple layers, and they just they don't know why they love Twin Peaks. And and people like us who research this stuff, it resonates on some weird level 
and 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 I I have a hard time describing it with words, but they were clearly tapping into some of these occult concepts. Yeah. That's funny. I'm, I'm I, proud I got of you, a, Isaac. I got a text message from Isaac a couple of weeks ago, and he's like, "Dude, Mark Frost follows you on X." And I was like, "Who's Mark Frost?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Tony, Tony, what are you doing? Yeah, you have to capitalize on that." No. Um, yeah, Mark, Mark Frost knows it all. I, and, I, and I've said this before, like, and I'm not the only one because I actually read this after I thought it. David Lynch, I think, is the expert on speaking to the subconscious. And that's when he films his stuff, he does very well at that. Mark Frost knew the occult concepts with which David Lynch could make contact with everyone's subconscious. And I think you've got this huge following in Twin Peaks because, and I would argue most people don't even understand why they love it so much. And, and, Mm -hmm. you know, the researchers like everyone on this panel here we kind of get more about like no 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 they're tapping into something here that has been tapped into for hundreds of years by secret societies and ancient mystery schools and occultist and you know he just well, you, goes you on tapped on. on you tapped on it uh isaac when you brought up the pentagram and i wasn't going to talk about this but the idea of pythagorean palaces right pythagoras using these numbers methesis which is a more mystical magical approach to ma- uh, to mathematics which the pythagoreans uh, essentially worship numbers because they believed it was a sort of system to hack the matrix now what's interesting about the pythagorean palaces is if uh, using the sacred geometry right so the pentagon the pentagram is also very important in the occult as we know as a sort of of the a sort of technology to transcend dimensions as i've been uh, come to understand it also you have the the triangle which is at the at the core of this because we have the bermuda triangle right off the coast of the east coast of florida well the triangle is the yoni it's it's the portal quite literally right it's the portal of manifestation so that's why it's used in the occult and if you think of florida again not to get too vulgar but it's a phallus it's the fla- phallus of the united mm-hmm. states not to to be stupid about it but it, it's literally a phallus and we know that in, in the occult, that's an important that's an important thing. That's why you have all the obelisk in ancient yeah. Egypt, why you have all the 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 tree symbolism, the all that stuff is related to it goes back to the phallus. And what but and, and the and the obelisk always has the reflecting pool around it. So the yeah. so that's interesting you say that that Florida is the phallus because it is surrounded by water, just like a reflecting pool, and it's that it's that polarity of, of opposing forces. You've got mm-hmm. the male and female, which again you go into all the occult practices and beliefs that's what they talk about you know going back to shakti and shiva being locked in harmony um yeah huge huge topics here you know the triangle pythagoras was teaching about how this was the mystical number of perfected harmony and then you fast forward to peter lavenda who juan was talking about who he he knows the whole deal peter lavenda knows it all he knows what's going on he knows he 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 talked about it in tom DeLong's book him him and tom DeLong wrote this book i argue it was all peter lavenda because i read Lavenda stuff but in the first book in their new sort of alien disclosure stuff um i think it's called like man god and war or something like that he talks about how he, he lays out all this gnostic framework and then he talks about how there's a connection between the triangle and the circle because in ritual magic the um the practitioner stands in the circle the, the magician stands in the circle and conjures entities in the triangle mm-hmm. and he said that what if it's the other way around that where see, people see crafts and they see triangles or they see circles usually sometimes they're cigars whatever or cubes right? too or cubes yeah. and and he's saying like what if it's like kind of like we're making contact magically on another level another dimension and we're kind of speaking to each other through magic which again ties us back to the Enochian language yes that's absolutely what they're trying to do absolutely wow. uh yeah. <laughs> you were talking <laughs> You were talking earlier, Tony, about these spirits of the Nephilim coming through these portals, right? And then maybe being able to take hold of uh, a more solid form, right? That's I believe that's where your mind was going with that. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I I want to let me just clarify real quick with what you're saying. I not just spirits, like actual, real, like flesh and blood type entities that are able to not be flesh and blood consistently. Right. Okay. Well, I, I've got a theory for you too. And this did adhere back to some of the stuff I've talked about on your show before. And, you know, for people that haven't heard before, you know, my forte is, uh, I mix the occult in a little bit, but I do go deep with the biblical stuff. And 
one of the things that I was thinking about uh, with these entities, are they the spirits of the dead Nephilim that are looking for host bodies? Now, if you go into any Nephilim lore at the deluge, at the flood, when the Nephilim were killed, at least the ones that were bad, and that's a little a disclaimer to people who go back and listen to the last episode I did on the confessionals about good Nephilim, but we're going to talk about the bad Nephilim that died at the deluge. Their spirits had no place to go. So after the flood, they are considered the demonic entities that are looking for host bodies. You know, some people get it a little uh, twisted when you're talking about fallen angels um, or as Alistair Crowley would talk about the secret chiefs or any of these guys from the Hermetic Order would talk about, which I think they're one and the same. And just in my opinion, um, these fallen entities cannot take over a host body. They may could avatar someone, but they cannot take over a body. These, these dead uh, spirits of the Nephilim or Raphaim or Emim, Zuzims, uh, any of these Anakim or any of the names that you see in biblical terms of what these Nephilim are when they die, uh, they're looking for host bodies. Now, I thought about something, Isaac, when you were talking about Typhon and him being, you know, of the water, a, a basically, a, you know, a, more of a dragon, uh, the, you know, son of Gaia and Tartarus, by the way, Tartarus is in the Bible as meaning hell uh, also. So you've got Typhon and it made me think of in the Bible, in Job, it talks about in Job 26, 5, the dead tremble, those beneath the waters and those who dwell in them. In the Hebrew, the dead is Raphaim or Rapha, and it's also used to mean ghosts of the dead, shades, or spirits. So it made me think about, okay, you've got this correlation between, you've got the Bermuda Triangle there, you've got cave systems underneath uh, obviously underneath Florida, obviously underneath this Miami area, are these spirits that came through this portal, are these spirits of the Raphaim or this Rapha, these shades that are coming through to possess people or find host bodies? And one of my theories has always been that uh, not all, but some of these gray entities are created as meat sacks for these old Nephilim of old to inhabit. Um, and that would be similar to anything in these government um, spheres that they create for these Nephilim to inhabit. So I'm wondering if that's what was coming through these portals because they didn't seem like they were solid. They didn't seem like that they were uh, moving. Matter of fact, the one guy said it was moving almost in a glitchy type of way. Like if you were looking at a TV screen and it was glitching back and forth, and then they would just move out and then back into consciousness. So I'm almost wondering if they are Nephilim, if they are Raphaim, but they're the dead spirits of the ones that died during the deluge. Mm. Yeah, there's a there's a spiritual battle component to this. I I wrote two books on aliens the last couple of years and. In my research, Willie Strieber talked about how he felt like his his the soul was the big issue for these entities, these aliens, whatever, right? Because he felt a sort of separation of soul from body. People who have near-death experiences will say they have uh, similar feelings. John Mack had this idea. Bob Lazar, he said that he saw documents about how mankind was genetically modified from aliens and how the aliens referred to our human bodies as containers, so th there, there is something to that. And then you talk about the skinwalker, uh, the, the skinwalker theory that there's these entities that can't inhabit a human body for a long period. So they show up as werewolves and aliens and all this other stuff. Man. So with this mall situation, uh, and this is a question probably for Juan and, and Joel and, and Isaac, because uh, I don't know. But uh, you guys were talking about the significance of triangle and the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, if if Miami had this happen, could we expect to possibly see things happen in Puerto Rico and Bermuda as well as the other two points of the Bermuda Triangle? Well, it's interesting because growing up, I was born in Puerto Rico and you can quickly see how, because I want to believe, 
I, I literally have a reptilian head and an alien right next to me. Okay. I, I want to believe in this stuff. I'm a skeptic. I'm a researcher. And I'll be the first to tell you, like Joel knows, like, I'll be like, these dudes are capping, bro. Like, there's no way, like, this isn't real. Like, like, give me more salt. Like, that's me. And that's why I'm researching this stuff. So if I'm, and then I'm I a always skeptic, retort just- to Juan with that, it is real. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you how. <laughs> We're yeah. So Joel will be like, no, nah, dude, this is, this is definitely real. I'm like, no, nah, bro, it's not. And in Puerto Rico, <laughs> we have the Chupacabra. And I grew up with stories of the Chupacabra, you know, sticking his hand in, claws into people's houses and all that stuff and trying to take him out, you know, through the shutters. And it's very easy to get lost in the sauce when it comes to this sort of stuff because the description of the Chupacabra came from the first interview that they ever did after the lady watched the movie Species. Okay, so that she took that idea of the chupacabra and the description that she gave, which was like a an alienoid reptilian with like spikes down its back and like this mutated creature that's living in the in the Puerto Rican rainforest. And then that's what everybody took. And it became a sort of collective egregore thought form and really spread out. So I, I'm, I'm when I'm listening to these stories about this happening here in, in Miami and all these different ideas that we're getting, it's like. Is that the psyop? Is that what they're trying to do to try and, and bring forth this thing and use us mm. as the manifestation and tapping into some sort of ancient occult uh, power in the land, whatever? I don't know. Uh, uh, but as far as Puerto Rico, I don't. I can't speak on Bermuda, but in Puerto Rico, there is a lot of UFO sightings and there is a lot of weird things that happen. Uh, and I think Justin just did an episode yeah, on the Chupacabra not, not too long ago both on the Bermuda Triangle and the Chupacabra. Mm-hmm. There's still the triangle over the last 10 years has been extra active. It seemed like it was a mm-hmm. dormant period for a long, you know, from probably the seventies on uh, stuff still going missing. Uh, the weirdest thing is the alive green fog that's being described. And then everything from mermen coming out of the ocean to steal chickens from locals on Bermuda and the Bahamas uh, to the lights in the blue holes where there's yes. kraken like entities guarding what they believe is either the entryway to Atlantis or in Puerto Rico technologies now. And in Puerto Alien. Rico, there's been, uh, I'm sorry, a few videos of exactly what you're talking in Puerto Rico of <laughs> these lights underwater <laughs> moving quickly around. So there's been numer- at least two or three that I can think of in Puerto Rico. Oh yeah. Same cave system. So it's all the same mm-hmm. cave system from Florida Puerto Rico to the Bahamas. It's all the same thing. So there's a cave system these, that these goes from trail. those from one point to the other? Yeah, it's all the same thing. It's like so when you go to the islands, like Puerto Rico, for example, or the Bahamas, they're fresh water in those holes you know, on the island a lot of the times. Yeah. And it's actually probably coming from mainland Florida. Uh, but there's the blue holes out in the ocean are humongous. Uh, there's even the nuclear submarine testing ground which is in the middle of the Bermuda Triangle that we talked about in our show that nobody really talks about ever. And there's a lot of OSUs, or no, the, the submersed UFOs coming out of the water happen mm-hmm. right there in basically this little grid square of saying no one's allowed to go here. And all these UFOs come shooting up out of the ocean there. But the triangle is so, definitely becoming more active. Tony, I, I can see your hesitation when it comes to the underwater aspect of it. And I think that's more important than... Then outer space. I think, in my opinion, uh, space might be fake. It might be a construct of, uh, you know, this, this system that we're in. And there's a reason why uh, uh, Ghislaine or Ghislaine, however you want to say it, Maxwell and Epstein all had islands. A lot of wealthy elites have islands. And we have Terramar, which was the whole organization of, of Ghislaine, where she was teaching wealthy elites how to operate submarines and i think that the answer to I was a lot of them say they're all submarine uh ready to go james cameron is as yeah. well james so, cameron you know, it, think about it it took him how long the to come out with camera. avatar 2 and then he was learned how to uh pilot a submarine and he's going underwater then all of a sudden he's like yeah well i got i got it now i've got uh avatar 2 for you guys <laughs> bro i think the answers are at the bottom of our oceans and, and right off the coast of puerto rico is one of the deepest parts of the atlantic ocean there's a there's a there's a drop a very deep drop and and i'll say this i mean you know curly was a mountaineer he climbed mountains to try and obtain magical powers or what if it was the the inversion what happens in the inversion if you go down into the bottom of the mirana trench what happens you acquire some i don't know i've never been oh, there have you been there joel like yeah no i mean and uh, i there, agree with you i'm with you 100 percent. there was no hesitation on my part i'm 
I, I, I actually have, um, I've talked about this sporadically over the years, but when I first started the podcast, uh, seven years ago, there was a guy that reached out to me who showed me a UFO coming out of the ocean. And Mm -hmm. when I saw that, I mean, that was, you know, 2017. So things were a lot different when it came to perception and what UFOs were and things like that back then. When I saw that, I was like, okay, so what's going on underneath these waters? And there definitely could be, uh, I mean, we we could go into a whole slew of things when it comes to going down under the water, what's down there. Um, Even, I hate to retread it, but even down to the idea of, what kind of portal is down there that lets you get into other realms and maybe even mm. uh, travel to other locations within this realm? Uh, there's a lot of weird things. I have, like I said, I had those pictures. Uh, I'll try to remember to post them again. I posted them throughout the years on on Instagram. But real quick, the story about it was uh, he. I think he was in Canada, and he had uh, there was a storm coming in off the bay, and so he was taking video of the storm. And when he took the video of the storm, he went back and he was trying to find a cool frame where the lightning was striking for to to take a screenshot for a picture. And at the point of a lightning strike, there is a flat disc shaped craft that is coming out of the water. And I have like two or three frames of it. And you literally see it shooting up out of the sky all while a lightning bolt is striking. So that's how fast this thing moved is that within a lightning bolt, it was it was gone. And so, uh, yeah, it, it's a, it's pretty fascinating. That, that kind of woke me up right back then to the idea of what's going on underneath the waters. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I think that, I think what you guys are talking about with all this uh, submarine talk and stuff, I'm like, oh, shoot, like we got, well, Bill yeah. Cooper, uh, you know, he's my red pill daddy, Bill Cooper. He talked about, that was one of his formative experiences to believe in a lot of conspiracies is he saw a USO one, right? flying out. His first one. Yeah, and I think it was after that that he saw the documents, and and he always questioned whether or not he was supposed to be, whether he was fed those documents and that information, or he was supposed to see it and leak it. He wasn't sure. Uh, so you know, he saw one, and then um, L. Ron Hubbard, who was part of the Babylon working rituals with Jack Parsons, he had the Sea Org, and he had the three mm-hmm. ships out there: the Diana, the Athena, and the Apollo, which uh, you know ties into the ideas of goddesses. And, and, you know, Athena is depicted as an owl that ties us into Twin Peaks and all this stuff. Well, we have the, the I like watching <laughs> terrible movies, Meg 2, which that's the idea of going oh, at the I, bottom of Ma- Mariana Trench. I just watched that the other day with my Pushing with my through kids, and going <laughs> oh, into another section of like the, <laughs> like, <what? laughs> that is real. Yeah. That, yeah. So there is a layer of sediment kind of, it's actually like hyper condensed, like salt water. So it's actually like almost like a thick slurry of salt. It sits on it because the thermo vents on the bottom of the ocean are heating it up, and but it gets colder, colder than it hits warm. So it literally looks like dirt. If you watch those videos of eels that'll venture in, there'll be dead stuff floating in that layer, mm-hmm. and you'll see eels that'll brave it and try to grab something out of there. If they spend just a couple seconds too long, they die of toxicity. So it's extremely poisonous to all forms of life. Whoa! There you go. So yeah, that would be a hard barrier between, but for the. The Puerto Rican cave, you just reminded me, Juan, is that it's one of the largest cave systems in the world, and it's absolutely banned from human exploration. Mm. Mm-hmm. And it got banned during the Puerto Rican Chupacabra outbreak in the 90s. Really? And they were, yeah. And they're, and they're artificial caves, too, because they have a ton of artificial uh, uh, tunnels uh, that, they, that they've made, the government, that are abandoned. And there's videos, yeah. and I've tried to get a contact that not only speaks Spanish, Trying to get in contact with this guy who went viral for going into one of these systems. And it's just miles and miles and miles of tunnels that the government was like, yeah, we used them. And then, uh, yeah, we don't use them anymore. It's like mm. essentially Puerto Rico is hollow. It yeah. really is. because It's like the tip of this ancient limestone chunk of rock and same with Florida and same with the island chain. You know, they're pretty much eroding away. And that's just what's left is this corpse of an old mountain range, essentially. Wow. Wow. That's wild. absolutely. So let me ask you guys a question about this uh, this claim that they were kids. So I, I've been trying to kind of take all the information in about this thing and you know try to logically look at stuff. Uh, one, I, I would say, I don't think so. Like we kind of hit on this a little bit earlier. If, if something happened, they wouldn't tell us, anyways, right? 
So, mm-hmm. so we can kind of put that on the table. What the, the police and all this, these officials saying that, you know, uh, nothing happened. Well, if something did happen, they would say nothing happened anyways. Uh, but when it comes to like, say the fireworks angle, could that be an explanation as to why they would shut down airports and, and flights? Just thought that, you know, if they, if their thought is that say there's 50 kids, but they don't know approaching the scene that there's, there, there, all they know is there's a lot of people shooting off fireworks at different people and things like that. Terroristic ideas start f- f- circulating around the responders and all of a sudden like ground all aircraft until we figure out what's going on here because we don't want anything getting shot at planes. Just trying to be devil's advocate with that thought. Yeah, I thought of that too, Tony. There's a, you could punch enough holes in this thing I, that to me, I'm kind of, I don't know, you take it or leave it. I, it's not definitive enough for me to just stand behind and be like, no, I'm going to die on this hill that those were aliens um but you're right it's i mean look at how they handled the phoenix lights you had the largest witness ufo event in history and they made a whole spectacle of it the governor fife simonton came out and made a joke about it and offended all these people and then years later he comes out and he's like yeah man they they told me to do that and it's like dude like i don't know why anyone would just trust what's that he was in the alien suit. He comes out in the alien suit. Was that that guy? Yeah, he had a, he, yeah, he had a guy in an alien suit come out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's like, uh, you know, and that's that's what I was saying is that a lot of people, and, and a good example of this is look at the the Epstein files came out right, mm-hmm. and the the mainstream media is kind of talking about it. All these people are talking about it. Then Cat Williams comes out the next day and he does a whole thing where he's airing out celebrities mm. in Hollywood. And people believe Cat Williams, right? Like more people are tuning into Cat Williams. At least this is from my perspective and maybe how I feel. I'm more tuned into what I want to hear what Cat Williams has to say versus what uh, you know, Fox yeah. and CNN want to tell me is in the Epstein files or, you know, and not to mention, like, I don't believe like, okay, they gave us some filtered. I'm sure they're not going to give us all this oh, yeah. damning information on the Epstein files anyway. So it's like nobody trusts those things that mm. much. Uh, so I don't know. We're just in a weird place right now where people got this sort of weird red pill the last few years and, and there's a battle to sort of guide all these people and everyone's fighting to get them down their path, you know? And, and, uh, you know, I'm, I kind of try to observe and and see what's going on, but it's really hard to know what's happening, but it is interesting that there are a lot of rational reasons. Like you say they're fireworks. It's like, well, that could have easily been mass shooting. You know, I mean, they could have thought that was mass shootings. It's not like that doesn't happen here. Everybody in and, Florida has a gun. Yeah, like that's very possible that it was just the police reacting. But I still think like that's still a lot of damn police. Yeah. I don't know, man. No, I so I just agree. I mean, like there's a, there's so many things that kind of um, put it like as that's a little excessive, uh, you know. Right. And yeah, because look at um, Uvalde. How many uh, the videos I've seen? It didn't look like there was that many cops there, and that was a you know. Right. Obviously a horrific thing. I don't know. Yeah. The first story they like pushed publicly was it was four teenagers in the mall with sticks and some fireworks causing it. They cut power. They shut down the airports. They cut power to six blocks. All these people are running video and all those videos disappeared really fast. And then immediately, like a day and a half later, the police walk it back and they say, no, it was actually 50 teenagers in the mall. We did not cut the power and the police just came out. I just either seen this this morning or yesterday night of recording this, that they said, no, we did not shut down any air traffic. No airspace was shut down. So they went from saying they did do all this to they didn't do all of this and isn't, within a, a two-day period. And isn't there like actual proof that they did? Like, there's some kind of like, yeah, you, can, you yeah. can look that stuff up. Yeah, it, it, they definitely did. But they went back there. So they're trying to backpedal that enough. Uh, a lot of the videos of these teens fighting were some of them were really old videos. Like, you know, there's mm-hmm. groups of teenagers fighting. You can find videos of groups of teenagers fighting and push it. Uh, one of the teens that kind of got blamed for it said that he was like just in his car and a beer ball got thrown. So he stepped out and he got arrested on the, you know, saying that he was one of the ones lighting off fireworks. And that was one of the kids they said they had arrested because they said they arrested like six or seven of the quote unquote perpetrators of this. So they already backtracked there. There's, I think it was yesterday morning. So that'd be, what is it today? So that'd be Saturday. They said they didn't, they did not shut down an African control and they did not cut the power. And you can see where they like there's videos of them cutting the power because it's just blank. And all this stuff and, goes black. Yeah. And, and there's yeah. other things that have kind of popped up over time here with this as well that just kind of make you think, okay, maybe wh- what, what is actually going on here? Because, uh, the, did you guys see the video of the, 
I don't know, guy, I don't know how old he is, but he called his dad, who's actually running for a sheriff in Miami. Yeah. Yeah. And his so, dad's like, I can't talk about it. What do you mean you can't talk about it, bro? Like, like what do you it looks staged to me, Tony? You think that looks staged? But if you look, if you I if you look if Why if you look at your dad, I from what I understand, if you look up that that guy, like it's literally his dad who's running. It's him. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like um, anyways, but uh there's this lady who came out a few days ago. She's got over six hundred thousand followers on X. And she does like Bitcoin and different things. Like she's not in this space. And she came out and recorded a video, released it on X, saying that she was in Miami in her car when all this was going on. And she recounts she retells her story of how it all went down from her perspective. She wasn't in the mall. So like if you're thinking like somebody wants to be part like grifting off this, you, you're putting yourself in the mall. I was there. This is what I saw. She said, I wasn't in the mall. I was in my car. Now remember, this lady has a huge following. So it's not like it's not like um it's the cloud. Yeah, it's not like she needs any like she has more followers than all of us combined. Uh mm-hmm. and so she's she says she's in her car and she hears the siren, she sees the police, she gets out, she asks somebody who was absolutely frantic about what was going on and the the, the person that she talked to said there were creatures in the mall. And so she's like, this person's like crazy. So let me find somebody else. <laughs> uh, but she gets her phone out and she said the police came running over to her right away and shut down the phone thing. They're like, no phones. Mm-hmm. And so like her, and then she also said that, and now remember she was in her car, she gets out. So I don't know how far away she is from the scene. She's in the area, but I take it she's not very close. Uh, and she says that she saw something that wasn't human. She's she doesn't know what it was. She was very vague on it. It wasn't like it wasn't like she was trying to give details. She's just like, whatever I saw, it wasn't human. And so when you hear things like that, I, I just sit back and I'm like, just knowing that if something happened, they wouldn't tell us anyways. I'm thinking mm-hmm. for me, and maybe it's because I want to believe, I'm like, something happened in Miami. And uh if, <laughs> and I want to go find out. <laughs> if 300 cop cars showed up to anywhere else in the country, that's a terrorist attack. Yeah. I mean, that's that kind of level of stuff or somebody's blowing something up. Like, it's that crazy. And then they're just saying it was four, well, now 50 teenagers with sticks. That's technically, technically, they wouldn't be terrorists if they're from another dimension. Well, here's the best part, too. There's been a, there's been a whole uh, mix up of the days as well. So, what they're saying is it happened on the second but footage of kids fighting actually happened on the first. And mm-hmm. now the police reports went from the second to now the first today. I matter of fact, I looked at the one you sent over to me, Justin, they moved it to the first. Yes. So there was an incident that happened in this, in a close by area, but not at the mall. And there were people that were filming it. They're merging it into this first date and saying, uh-huh. Oh, this is when it happened. So they're muddling the truth. So again, I'm with all you guys. We don't know. We really don't, but we do know they're lying. I think that's one thing that everybody here can agree is yeah. that they're not telling us what happened, no matter what it was. Even if it had nothing to do with entities or aliens or whatever, something went down there that they don't want us knowing about. And then, you know, as being, you know, conspiratorial minded as everybody here is, we're going to, our minds are going to start working over time because we're now going to try to put, put the pieces together of what actually happened. And if they're not going to tell us the truth, then honestly, people's minds are going to, you know, go wild. We're going to go to the furthest place possible, then, you know, maybe reel back in. And I love that. Yeah, and, and <laughs> by the way, I love that. And they're, okay, they're okay with that because the, and, and, um, you know the re- and the reason why I don't think they tell us the truth is because they don't have the full answers. And if you come out and say, "Hey, there's this thing, but we don't really know anything about it," that looks supposedly weak. Whereas, you know, open-minded free thinkers like us would probably say, well, "I respect that. Yeah, I, let's figure out what this is. That is weird." But they look at it. You know, it's like that's why politicians lie. They got to look like they got it all under control. And look, everyone, you're safe and secure with me. And and they can't tell you the truth because they don't know yeah. the truth. And Another angle of this is in, in Freemasonry, the, the 33rd degree, which is the highest degree of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Um, there's a, there's a, a motto they use called order ab chaos, means order out of chaos. And 
you know, the, Bill Cooper, again, my red pill daddy, he had a whole like 30 hour series about called Mystery Babylon. And he talked about Order Abkeo. And he said, this isn't a strictly a Freemason thing. This goes back to ancient cults from hundreds of years ago. Mm-hmm. And they knew that if you wanted to seize power and to really control people, you have to instill enough fear and chaos that people are begging for order. They want the mm-hmm. order. So you, you promote this idea of chaos. And, and, and this is what Ronald Reagan was talking about when he, back in the 87, he was at the UN and he said, Oh, I wish there was an alien threat. We could all band <laughs> together. You know, that's, he was saying it out loud because he's an idiot. And, and this is what these globalists think. They, they're trying to promote. Because I I take it to a spiritual realm. I think there's a spiritual battle. It's the age old story. I don't know of any other rationale for why all this weird stuff is happening. I think that they believe in this this concept called the great work. They they have to do whatever it takes to instill this Luciferian global government. And I don't know precisely what that looks like. I just know that that's the angle. Of, of, they think Lucifer is really the the real god to them, and and they want to make this utopia fantasy world that will actually be a living hell um and 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 this goes you know and i'm not the first one to say this stuff go back to the uh there's a an orthodox monk named father seraphim rose he was telling us this in the 60s he wrote a book called orthodoxy and the religion of the future and if you read that you're you'll be complete convert red pill because you're like dude this guy knew what was going on in the 60s he talks about how science fiction is here to uh, manipulate us in the entertainment world because they're all pushing occult new age ideas because there's an end game for them and and it, it was followed like a script for the last 60 years and it all makes sense when you understand the occult perspective of of making contact with aliens and jack parsons and crowley and all these wackadoodles uh because I say they're wackadoodles, but I do think that their practices are authentic, meaning that they do work. And uh, I think that's mm-hmm. why people like the the Collins elite in the Pentagon they've been studying this as well for all these years. And that's what kills me is the 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 gaslighting when they when in you know was just a couple of years ago they said okay we we've been researching UFOs we called a tip and you know it wasn't really fruitful. It's like dude, you guys are so bad at lying. Like you've been doing this since Project. <laughs> Project Sign and Grudge and Blue Book. You guys yeah, have been doing the all this stuff. Net and didn't get any of them. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. so what you're talking about, Isaac? To to quote, so this is C. W. Ledbetter, which I know you know that from the Theosophical Society. This is he's making a comment on Crowley because you just mentioned Crowley and how their systems work. We know this. Like, there's a. There, I, I do believe that that the occult is a real thing, and I do believe that they're tapping into forces that are uh, are. Uh, m- not understood, not misunderstood, but not understood because we don't know. And he's talking about, this is in 1894, and he's commenting on Crowley describing entities uh, by Crowley as certain vast stars or aggregates of experience. So he's talking about the the great old ones, the deep ones, the outer ones, right? Out, outside of space and time. And Ledbetter in 1894 says, and this is from Beyond the Mob Zone by Grant. He goes, if we if we ever do come in contact with them, it will most probably be on the purely physical plane. For in any case, their connection with our astral plane is of the slightest since the only possibility of their appearance there depends upon an extremely improbable accident and an act of ceremonial magic, which fortunately only a few of the most advanced sorcerers know how to perform. Nevertheless, that improbable accident has happened at least once and many and may happen again. So this is 1894 C.W. Ledbetter of the Theosophical Society uh, talking about uh, coming in contact with these entities, maybe perhaps through ceremonial magic, right? The world's a stage. A lot of these things seem staged, you know, yeah. and and so uh, I think that plays a role into it, but it, it could happen on accident too. They might just pop in. Hey, how you doing? Oh, we're at a mall. Let me go buy some new Nikes or something like that, right? And, and then... <laughs> Le- I think we'll Ledbetter was out. part of the 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 sex magic push. Uh, sorry, what, Joel, uh, off you, right to you. Um, but you know, sex magic is the idea that you can open these gateways to these these deeper processes of low conscious thought. Mm-hmm. And I think Ledbetter and the, the- uh, Theosophical Society were pushing that. Sorry, Joel, go ahead. Uh, no worries at all. So it made me think you were just talking about projects, and I wanted to bring up today Project Bluebeam because I know that this is a huge buzzword in the community it has been for the past four years and it's and honestly it's being used 
incorrectly, mostly by people online. Anytime they see something that they think is fake or whatever, they will respond with a comment with just two words, blue beam. And most of these people don't really understand in context of what blue beam actually is. Uh, Serge Manast and Omar Falali actually wrote the book. It wasn't even a book. It was more of a paper. They wrote several books together. Uh, oddly enough, the two died uh, two weeks apart in 1996, both with uh, heart attacks, and neither of them had any heart condition. So that was that was a real strange thing. So I do think that Serge Manasse was onto some stuff for sure. Um, <clears throat> when most people hear the words blue beam, they think holographic images that are projected to trick us into seeing something that's not there or an alien invasion. But actually, when Serge wrote it, though, he broke it down because it was a NASA program and there were five different aspects to this program. And the first one was an engineered earthquakes and hoax discoveries. So apparently there's going to be, according to him, earthquakes and these discoveries that they find all across the earth will show us that the religions of the past don't exist and it will move our minds into a state of accepting something new. Something I've heard you say, Isaac, a lot in the past is the new religions, what? The no, no religion, right? So that's that's something that you've always said, and that really rang true to me when we're looking at this whole blue beam thing and where we're moving in this spiritual warfare that's going on, because the next step is the big space show in the sky. He doesn't talk about UFOs, though, really, except it being them uh, trying out new things and maybe showcasing UFOs as them working on uh, the equipment. But really, their his, the entire operation is built on a second coming of Christ or some sort of God, whatever God that is in, in the vicinity that you're in culturally will be represented in that area. And everyone will coincide all at once and realize that this entity or these aliens or whatever are here to lead us into the future. I don't think that alien sightings or even if the thing in Miami is real, that I don't think they're going to be fake like that. I think that when these entities are revealed and Juan was just talking about it, then being in the physical realm, if they're in the physical realm, I think that if blue beam is used as it's supposed to be used in the Serge Manass document, that blue beam is actually to move us away from God and move us into a place to be controlled more by whatever entities that they bring in as gods to us. So I do think that these entities will be revealed. I think we're going to see them. And I sadly think the people that think everything's fake are going to be wholly deceived when this actually happens because they won't know what to do because they won't know how to accept what's in front of them. I call them the geopolitical conspiracy theorist only. They only believe in this geopolitical realm of control and they don't see how that the occult is highly, highly connected to politics, highly connected to the entertainment industry. These people believe it. Listen, you don't have to believe it, but they act on what they believe. And if they do that, they will control you. And if you're not aware, at least somewhat of what's going on, you're going to be deceived in the end. Just in my opinion. Amen, I brother. I dig that. There's a there's a idea of predictive programming that people in the conspiracy world have been talking about forever, and it's it's the idea of and in, in, of instilling these ideas and themes below the subconscious level. And um, I, I don't know if I mentioned this already, but there's there's a neuroscientist named Jeffrey Zachs who talked about building cognitive models. Meaning, I watch a TV show. There's aliens on the show. My brain has to do some work. It builds a cognitive model of oh, there's these alien things. But then your other part of your brain has to come through and say, yeah, but that was just fiction on a TV show, right? Um, so they do this predictive programming over the years. And and one idea, I think, Juan, you were touching on this maybe, or, or maybe it was Joel, sorry. But someone was saying about how, in a way, things like events like this start making people conceptualize and sort of maybe even believe in aliens. And in a way, maybe the occult practices are that it can manifest reality, the reality of aliens. Um, and what's interesting is that Stanley Kubrick in 2001, a space odyssey, there was a fictional storyline. I think this is just in the novel, not the movie uh, written by Arthur C. Clarke, of course, who was big into all this stuff, but there was a fictional storyline of a thing called project Barsoom 
that the Department of Defense was studying uh, fictional, quote unquote, but <laughs> that that they were convincing humans that they were contacted by aliens through the use of drugs, hallucinations, hypnosis, visual effects. And when you read the occult stuff like the Lords of the Left Hand Path, they talk about all the different you know, ancient rituals of how you can make contact with the gods, with the divine, as they say. And, and, you know, there, there's a couple phrases I use, Joel. Um, there, there's a line in a rap song that says, um, uh, her, the new religion is no religion. And then, and I say that, and then also Helena Blavatsky from Theosophy, she said the religion of the future is the religion of the past, which again, mm -hmm. hundreds of years of occult practices and, and it's all, about manifesting and making contact because that's what you know helena blavatsky and alistair crowley all these occultists had one one goal they all had shared together and that was to destroy christianity uh mm -hmm. jack and you can say what you want you know look i'm a christian but i'm the most lukewarm guy i have a hard time with a lot of the beliefs i'm not professing to be like no we all have to be christian like i'm just saying leave that, leave, they all have my job. shared interest and that's it all right, Tony. Preach, that's brother, that's, that's my job. I'm 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 not the guy to do it. <laughs> I, no, I, I get comments and stuff. Wish you wouldn't talk about God so much. Well, you know, like I, I don't know what to tell you. So, you know, it's funny when I started because I've been doing I've been sort of blogging and podcasting since 2011, and when I started out, I avoided the religion topic because I always said like, look, man, I, I struggle enough. I'm not going to be here the guy to sit here and thump the Bible and say you should do this or believe this. And I still stand by that. I, I really don't care what people believe. Um, I have a hard enough time myself trying to, you know, be a good Christian. But the 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 truth of the matter is, you know, maybe I was I don't even know how many years into it I was, six, seven, eight years into it when I finally just came around and said, you you can't avoid it. It boils down to spirituality. When you try to rack your brain about why this is happening, what is happening all the occultists, they flat out will tell you the truth. And, and, and it's just, it's just where it goes and it has to it, go It's there. funny because you, like you said, you can't avoid it. And it's it, from the occultic angle, the conspiracy angle, the paranormal angle, it all points in the same direction. Uh -huh. And it, if, homunculus. It, yeah. Exactly. Homunculus. It's always, it's always the homunculus. <laughs> <laughs> but all paths lead to homunculus. I mean, it, it's literally, I mean, if you, at some point you just got to cross that path. And if you don't, then you're just putting on those blinders just to, I don't know, to, to make yourself feel good that you don't have to adjust any way of lifestyle on your end. I don't know. Um, at the time of this recording, I'm trying to think, okay, so this is going to, yeah. So on my Thursday show, there's a little nugget um, along these lines inside that episode for the members. Um, I just, I get a little moody, but uh <laughs> That's for the members. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I just think that there's a lot of uh, people that kind of avoid the the spiritual aspect of this stuff when it comes to everything we're talking about. And I think it's mostly for their own comfortability. Uh, I mean, because everybody's fine with talking about, you know, oh, magic and black magic and this, that and the other. But as soon as you bring in the other side of it, it's like, oh, well, you know, you stinking, you know, Christians. Um, so Speaking of magic, though, uh, somebody, I think it might have been Juan, was talking about the South Florida magical community. Was that, I'm assuming that was you, Juan? Did you said that? Yeah, and by that I was referring to the Santeria, Paolo, uh, Afro, uh, what they call it, Afro something or other, but essentially voodoo, right? So the, the dark magic, Could, and that's, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. So, so uh, along those lines, um, the reports of teenagers coming in the mall with a device and then these things came out could that have been something that was connected to some kind of florida floridian magic community so the i've heard of stories and i don't know if you had this guy on before but he he runs this this exploration YouTube channel. He was on Rogan, actually. I don't know, but I, I could have swore I've heard him on your show or not. Anyways, he people found... people often confuse my show with Rogan. You know, it's just it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, the the he found there's an old abandoned space. Uh, they they were testing rockets, an old abandoned rocket testing facility over down in Homestead off of US one. The locals don't know what I'm talking about. And he said that he went there because you can go and there's still a, a freaking rocket in this silo, right? And that was the early, I don't know what years. And essentially, allegedly, he found some like satanic ritual site within that 
rocket facility, the, the, the abandoned facility. And the, the idea of maybe South Florida being more open to, I mean, there's Little Havana, which th- that's the whole thing down there. And it ties into the Hysteria High story of the 1970s, where allegedly the owner of that school was a Santero, right? He would dress in all white and he would have the necklaces and everything. And to, to fetch it and say that, that maybe there wasn't somebody with a device that went in there and like, a genie in a bottle or a gin in a box opened it up and wanted to mess around with people. I wouldn't rule that out. I wouldn't rule that at all. I mean, that that's essentially, yeah. I mean, I think that's a real thing. And again, no disrespect to anybody and anyone's religion, but the, yeah, that could be something that, that could possibly be of that angle. And I do think that 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 was a lot of cops for a fight. And the way I heard it was that the day before how Joe was saying there was a fight and now people are mix, mixing up the two. Now, to talk about what Isaac was talking about, Kevin Spacey and the whole Tucker Carlson thing, where some people say that wasn't Kevin Spacey. Some people say it was. Well, he said one thing in that whole spiel that he was going on about that really stood out to me the most because I've talked about this a whole bunch of times. And it's when he talks about, he goes, you know, when the fiction and the reality intermingle together, that's when it really something along the lines of that's when it really, you know, sets me off, you know, I'm paraphrasing. And that's essentially what they're doing now. Mm -hmm. They're taking the fiction and the reality. Whenever you watch a movie that says based on true events, it slaps differently. Like you go, yeah. Oh, this could have, this could have happened. Like, and then you're, you're left to wonder what part is the real part. Mm -hmm. It could all be real to you if it's real to you, you know, and that's the dangerous part of it. Cause this, you know, this is where you step into chaos magic and everything, right? And what's they're saying in, in chaos magic? I say it's like, uh, everything is permitted. Nothing is something or other. You know what I'm talking about? The, the whole, uh, chaos magician saying, I don't know the phrase. Sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll find it, but it's essentially it's like everything is permitted and the everything is permitted is like, well, you can adopt any said God for one purpose, use it for that ceremony, chuck them out. And that's why. On our money, which is tied to the founding of Florida, which is tied to John D. Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller and all these guys. Well, on our money, it says, in God we trust. And I've always made the joke. I go, yeah, but which God? Because mm-hmm. uh, we don't know. We assume it's the the God that we all know and love, right? Jesus Christ and everything. It's like, yeah, but to these people who were in secret societies, part of the hellfire clubs and all these things, we don't know what miscellaneous gods that they were worshiping. And it's on our money. But hey. Here's all these sigils on our money. We have the all seeing eye and this pyramid at the back of it. But hey, in God, we trust everybody, right? And the monetary system is one of the biggest, right? So you talked about the order of the nine angles. The, the money system is one of the biggest sacrificial uh, uh, systems that there is. You know, we're sacrificing not only literally people for money, but uh, uh, figuratively, we're sacrificing our next generations, our kids generation and their generation they're going to live with all this debt that's left behind and, and god knows what so that's one of the biggest sacrificial systems that there is the money system people die over the military industrial complex and it's all run by these people say all oh, these guys weren't occultists it doesn't matter if they were or not maybe they're being controlled and who you know who knows i'm, I'm just rambling now but who but knows if one you, you know what? Um, I, I don't want to go back too far, but you were talking about the Joe Rogan thing with the Python cowboy who was out investigating yes. the Aerojet facility at Everglades. I actually did a show about it. And when you watch the video, there's a doll he comes across that's got snakes wrapped around its neck. Yes. And the the type of snake it is, it's um, a red scarlet snake. Mm-hmm. And of course, no one in Joe Rogan or Python cowboy kind of thought anything of that, but that is, of course, significant to the occult because Aleister Crowley and Jack Parsons, they had these obsessions about the Scarlet Woman, this yep. this elemental that they were going to evoke to create a moon child to create the Antichrist. Uh, so I just find it very curious that that was the name of the snake that he did stumble upon. And think how many hey, bodies there are in the, the Everglades. Uh, while you brought up the uh, money aspect of it, and I was just talking about Bluebeam, that's the final phase, the fifth phase, phasing out cash and independence. I mean, that's part of what they want to do at the top. And you see, we're moving towards more digital by the day. And, you know, that's eventually going to move us into some sort of one world currency. It's just going to make it easier. Right. And I do think that that's a part of all of this, but you know, these entities and everything else is just the 
mixing of fiction and in reality and to the point that we don't know what's going on and then we're running around like chickens with our heads cut off and i think if we realize at the end of the day that this is a spiritual battle and we can ground ourselves in our faith i think at that point you realize there's nothing to fear and you understand that a lot of this is fear mongering and then you can you can you can uh, wholly base yourself in that, and then you can start seeing through the mist a little bit more. I- at least for me, it's mm-hmm. been that way. Mm. You know, um, we were talking, I forget how my thought process went there. It's usually how it works. Uh, but there is a guy, I can't, I really, I know people hate when I do this, but I really can't reveal which guest it was on my show. But there was a guest on my show that after we were done recording, he talked to me about his experiences working within. Um, I forget what department he was in, but he was governmental department and uh, it's some kind of space stuff. And um, <clears throat> he talked about how before every rocket launch, there would be black masses that they would do. And mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. that's like, something that you hear about. But then when I, when I have somebody who actually comes from that world, and he's like, no, that's, that's exactly what they do. It kind of puts a whole spin on that whole... Um, uh, I'm sure you guys heard of it, the the NASA T minus thing. You guys hear about that? So they mm-hmm. they I, I don't know if it's I guess let's call it a conspiracy theory, but it's this idea that um, NASA uh, and the whole Satan angle and the reason why they say T minus is because that's the letter of the alphabet missing out of Na- out of NASA, and so it's it's uh, T minus oh. and NASA. Uh, if you you know add those oh. things together, it spells Satan. So. Uh, I, I just, uh, you guys never heard that before? <laughs> I mean, that, that's kind oh. of fun. That's a fun little conspiracy. Yeah, like Jeez, look at that. Well, I, Parsons I, I'm educating actually... you guys now. Look at that. <laughs> Let's go. Parsons actually would <laughs> recite the hymn to Pan before every rocket launch. Parsons. And the interesting part of Pan is, right, is related to panic. And what do we have in a lot of these different scenarios? Panic. Right. And, and the idea of that really, and I think they take that and they relate it to Baphomet in some sort of way, right? We know Baphomet's real big in the occult community. And the, the fact that this situation happened in one of the most wealthy parts of Miami, Brickle, which is like their, you know, it's like a whole exclusive island, whole bunch of high rises and all this stuff downtown. That's the money aspect right there. Money's flowing there, you know? So there's a lot of money going through those parts and how you're saying maybe it was some, you know, I hate when people do this in the occult community and then the conspiracy community is like, oh, it was all a ritual. So, yeah, well, what kind of ritual was it? It's like, oh, it was just a ritual. All right. But it could have it could have been. I don't know. It could have been a ritual. I mean, that you have the Miami Circle. Not, I, I don't know how, if it's how far it is from there, but it's an old ancient site. Right. With the with the uh, with astrological alignments and all that stuff. So that could play a role into the Tequesta people of the, you know, the ancient area. And who knows that they're powering that? And what if they're pissed off that they were, you know, wiped out and 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 taken out? And now all over their ancient sacred sites are higher. You literally have the Miami Circle, and right next to it is a freaking apartment complex, like a whole building. It's like those people. I don't think were, were, were would be happy about that, you know. And and I do believe that sp- spirits linger. And I think that maybe who knows if it was some indigenous spirit that was terrorizing those people we don't know what they built that place on and there's a reason why it's there brickle miami is there for a reason it's not there just because so yeah Hmm. well guys uh i think that this was a good conversation and if you're ready i'm ready to get to miami and go find ourselves some nephilim so uh do it I pick everybody up on the way in the bus. I think I'll pass everybody. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, you're covering gas too, right? <laughs> yeah, we'll take care of it. Don't worry. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, Joel, don't forget the Nephilim blaster at home, please. Okay. Last time was a debacle. So, uh, yeah, I got it. Anyways, guys, I appreciate you hopping on with me and talking about all this stuff. Uh, I, I just, when, when I saw the Miami stuff happen, uh, it, I actually saw it a few days before it started popping off. And what was crazy about it was, I, I literally saw on X somebody posted something. I remember seeing the video of all the police cars, and uh, I took a screenshot of that tweet or or X, whatever you call it these days, because I, I was like, I gotta remember to go back and check this out, whatever this is, because it's like creatures in the mall, whatever. And then that screenshot is just gone, and so 
then it started popping off a few days, a few days later. And I was like, yo, I got to talk about this. Like, this is too juicy. I, like, I, I think the, I think the audience would be pissed if I didn't do a Tuesday show about the, the Miami mall monsters. So, uh, that's what we did. Uh, before we get out of here, just everybody let everybody else know. Er- everybody let the audience know uh, where they can find you. We'll start off with Juan, then Joel, then Justin. Can then I Isaac. can I go last? Because I have a confession for the confession. Okay, so we'll start with Joel, then Justin, then Isaac, then Juan. Yeah, you can find me at Linktree slash Joel Thomas Media. And you can find me on any platform at Joel Thomas Media. Um, uh, I've got a lot of cool stuff that I'm working with with Tony with Marco Media. Uh, new podcast is on the way as well. So that will be dropping in the next few weeks. Um, but you can catch me there to see whatever's happening. Yeah, you can find us at all the at cryptocorn.com or on Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. You find the podcast anywhere. Uh, we're ripping off Tony again, and we finally got our member space up and running. So. We just did that, but yeah, there you go. The uh, oh, this is a great panel, by the way, Tony. Good job, everyone on here is impressing me. So thank awesome. you very much for uh, inviting me to this group. Uh, one last thing is that these rituals—they're not just about promoting and propagating symbols. It's about paving our minds to accept new realities and new truths. So just kind of keep that in mind because you know, what I do is I always study. I do. I have a podcast called Occult Symbolism and Pop Culture. You can find it everywhere. And we talk about symbolism in film and television, pop culture events and things like that and talk about the Illuminati conspiracies and aliens. But um, I think there's a there's a bigger goal at hand. And I think the, the more we can wrap our minds around it, the better we'll be off. Uh, and I also have a website, IlluminatiWatcher.com, where you can get all the information. And then uh, I've written a whole bunch of books, a couple on aliens. You can find all of them on Amazon, self-narrated on Audible under Isaac Weishop. All right, thanks. Uh, and before we get to to Juan, uh, I'll say that could we? I I, I got to be guarded with how I say this because I don't know what YouTube standards are. But could we be living in the reset that was talked about a few years ago? Uh, and the idea of I, I kind of did a video on this. Uh, it looks like three years ago now. Uh, it, it didn't get a lot of traction. Only five hundred views on Rumble. How dare you? But it, basically, the idea is if you break down the word reset, R-E and then S-E-T, Ra and Set, order out of chaos, those are the, those gods are uh, literally that. It's uh, Ra is the god of order, Set is the god of chaos. And so could we be living in the reset right now? And they're creating the new order out of the chaos that they're creating. So it's very interesting stuff. Juan, go ahead. You can find me, Juan on Juan Podcast, on any podcast platform. I'm on YouTube. I got a Patreon for those interested. My website's tjojp.com. And I want to say, Tony, thank you for having me on. Joel, Isaac, Justin, I love you all, Tony. And also, I'd be, I'd love to host you guys. You guys want to come down and, and also shoot a documentary or something. We'll hook up with Bigfoot Stacy, go hunt for the skunk ape. We'll go to the, the Crowley Cottage and we'll go hunt for some Nephilim. And I think. I might be responsible for this whole entity encounter because on the 24th, I was there at the Robert Foss Museum. And, you know, Tony, you always say that the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. But I think it might get some people a knocking because I think what might have happened was I might have had a homunculus in my pocket at the time. And when I went ahead, I kind of might have dropped it. And I think that, that, that I think they're coming in now. Oh, my goodness.
Jesus with Jesus, I'm a chimera Looking at these gold years flying by by fair force They cutting it off for the food too Analytics they use to recruit you War is a painting that sets on your son's too They don't want an individual just to carve a copy You sit in that man, a cotty, yeah, I'm talking saucy All they want to build is a prison world full of pet Tamagotchis Like a kamikaze, got me out of body like I'm Goku SS3 They want to push me to the center like a cell They want to spin up at the center of the nexus, man yeah, yeah.